Thank you for joining me. My name is Sherry Bartlett. My subject today is telling stories with my art. So I'm going to tell you a few stories and show you some of the artwork that I have in the show that's available and also some of the art that I've done in the past and tell you a little bit about encaustic because that is the medium that I use is encaustic which is a combination is it's like a beeswax a combination of beeswax and tree resin so I will I have done uh, quite an extensive uh, demonstration and you can find that on my IGTV of how encaustic is used but basically it is melted down and and you use it as a paint so it, you can add pigments to it or you can use it clear and I use it in both ways and I also use color on top so I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the alcohol ink paintings that I do as well today. I love encaustic because it has this amazing translucence and it's got a sheen to it. You can buff it up if it's smoothly painted on, you can buff it up and it looks, it looks almost like this milky kind of a glass. You can layer different um, materials in it and with encaustic you need to layer upon layer and fuse between the layers so there's a lot of history and um, depth in the paintings and uh, it can be applied in a lot of different ways you can use it three-dimensionally or two-dimensionally so i'm going to show you a little bit today of how i use encaustic both two and three-dimensionally so today my talk is about telling stories and I thought that um, I would begin by telling you a story of something that happened last week at the Culture Crawl here when a collector came in to my studio to buy a painting. And she started looking around and was asking me stories, asking me to tell her stories about the different paintings. And I always love to share that with, with people so that they know a little bit of the background and what my intention was and a little bit of the history of the story. She was really surprised by what the paintings look like in person because they uh, appear very differently than they do uh, when you're looking at on a screen or a photograph. They're quite three-dimensional and also that sense of translucence of them really isn't possible to see when you, you're just looking at a photo. So she was looking around and all of a sudden she saw a painting kind of off in the corner and. Uh, it was a painting I am really fond of, but I debated whether to tell her the true story about the painting because um, at one point I called it the white dud because it was a failure. It was a failed painting and it ended up, one of the things with encaustic is when it turns into a mess, it's just a great big soupy wax mess. And that's what this was. So I, um, I had documented this trajectory of this painting uh, and made a few Instagram videos of it because I was really struggling with trying to create it into something that I felt proud of and felt that it told a, an important story. So um, I decided in the end to tell her the story of the struggles of the painting because there it was and it's not very often one can look at, at that process of the development of a painting and I wanted to let her know about that so I did and in the end she uh, well I won't tell you the end to the story I will um, I'll tell you at the end in the meantime I just wanted to tell you a few other stories about some of the paintings that I'm going to show you today so stay tuned for the end um, often uh, stories are uh, told with picture books so I thought I would show you I guess this is probably going to appear opposite. You're going to have to read backwards here. But this is a, a book of picture book, basically, of artwork used uh, made with encaustic. So it really shows you the variety of possibilities sculpturally, two dimensional painting, books, poured wax mono prints there's a whole variety of work in here so i would highly recommend this book if you're interested in encaustic and how it might be applied it's uh, made by schiffer publishing and i am really proud to have several works in this book 
which I will show you here because I'm going to talk about one of them today and I'll be talking about uh, these other ones tomorrow. So I wanted to talk to you about this painting which is called Daedalus's Gift and I will show you another picture of it on the screen in a couple of minutes. Um, but I wanted to just tell you about that story. That is the story, it, it uh, sort of follows the story of Icarus. And you will remember that Icarus uh, was the young man that was imprisoned or that was caught in the labyrinth with the Minotaur. And Daedalus, which was the name of, this is a fictional story, a Greek mythical tale, of course, but Daedalus was um, Icarus's father. And Daedalus made a set of wings for Icarus out of wax and feathers so that he could escape the, the labyrinth. But he warned him, he warned Icarus that if he flew too close to the sun, his wings would melt. So Daedalus, um, Icarus did indeed escape from the labyrinth, but got so excited by this amazing world that he was able to fly over and his freedom, and in fact did fly too close to the sun with those wings, and I'm sure you know what happened in the end. It had a sad ending. And we uh, were told this story by Ovid, who was the Greek poet. So at the time, I, uh, I made a, a couple of sculptures based on this story and I was touched by it because at the time I had two teenage children. I, our son was 16 and our daughter was 14 and our, our young man was quite, you know, he was on that, in that place when you're 16 of just being on the edge of, of adulthood and excited by the world. And I went through being a somewhat worrisome mother. I went through my own challenges about that and worried about the risks that he might be facing and his decision making. And um, in the end, of course, I had to come to terms with the fact that um, as a parent, you have to let your children go and face your own fears and let them fly. So this story of Icarus really touched me so I'm gonna show you a couple of close-ups of the painting that I did called Daedalus's Gift. Oh, I forgot to show you the white dud. That is a picture of the white dud, how terrible it looked. So I'll, um, I'll show you a final version of it after. So this is a uh, photograph of the sculpture that I did called Daedalus's Gift. And I made the feathers, if you will, out of Lutridur, which is a spun bonded fiber, and beeswax. And I hand rusted the, uh, the Lutridur. And then I printed it with the words of Ovid's poem uh, about Icarus. And I made a mold for the arm, and I cast the mold in wax. So, um, as I was making this, I'll show you a couple of details of it close up. You can see the poetry that's printed onto the so-called feathers. And also this beautiful sense of light that comes through the Lutridor because it's a spun bonded fiber. It, um, it has little wee holes in it. So. so I will go back to my screen. There we go. So uh, it occurred to me that I, I knew that I would be facing the same challenges with our daughter who um, was just following up, 14 at the time. And I wondered, what about if Daedalus had a daughter? Did he have a daughter? And would he have made her a set of wings as well? So I did some research to find out whether Icarus had a sister. and. Um, it turns out that women didn't often play a really big role in Greek mythology and we don't even know if Icarus had a mother, but apparently one was added in in subsequent versions of the tale. But apparently Icarus never did have a sister. He had a brother, uh, but I invented a sister for him 
and I did a second sculpture that was called Icarus's sister. So that's this one that's behind me. Just lift it down again. It's a rusted Lutridor. And perhaps you can see here the three-dimensionality. It has a cast. This is a porcelain arm and it has this uh, three-dimensional buildup of wax and rusted lutridor. So that is that painting. Oops, a little crooked, but there we go. So um, humans have always been storytellers. Oh, that just looks terrible, that crooked. Oh well, too bad. We've always been storytellers and these narratives kind of help us to communicate, to learn, uh, feel emotion and reflect and really um, just explore that experience of being human. And at one time, uh, the majority of people were illiterate. So the way to pass down cultural stories without being able to read was uh, telling the stories visually, printing them onto vase, uh, expressing them on vases or sculptures or paintings. And artists would use compositional tools like gesture and color and light and dark and shapes and rhythm to really communicate that story in a really powerful way. And if you think of churches that you may have been in Europe, for example, or religious icons that you've seen, um, they often are used, art is often used as a way of retelling a story visually. Um, so when I am creating my artwork, I often don't know what the story is before I start. And what I find is that as I'm painting, I start to think, I get ideas, I do research on them and um, come up with the story as I'm working with the artwork. So um, I just wanted to show you a, uh, an example of another sculpture here that I'm gonna talk about tomorrow and it's a little bit hard to see, but it's a huge uh, oyster shell that I've built out of paper and encaustic. And I'll talk to that, uh, talk about that tomorrow and another uh, installation I did using shells and tell you a little bit about the stories of those. They're called um, Afterlife and A Sense of Place. So I'll tell you those, those stories, but first I wanted to tell you, show you a few of the paintings that I have in my Culture Crawl exhibit. And uh, the largest body of work uh, is around, it's, it's um, exploring nature. Nature is a major interest of mine. And I've had the good fortune of traveling quite a little, quite a bit in my life. And one of the things I love to do when I'm traveling is go snorkeling. And one time I was so enamored with the undersea world that I really didn't want to come up and come back to land and be a person anymore. So I, I sort of imagined I might turn into a mermaid, but it turns out life as a mermaid is not necessarily as much as it's cracked up to be. So I ended up coming back to Earth. But as I've traveled over the years, I've really noticed the devastating effects of climate change on undersea life and uh, noticed how human behavior and also um, the environmental issues, environmental effects have uh, affected coral, uh, coral bleaching and the loss of fish and the rising sea temperatures and the changes in water chemistry and all of the effects that that's had on undersea life. So this body of work in part is an exploration of that. It's called inexorable, inexorable growth. Um, it's looking at life, uh, natural life on earth and also under sea and this whole process of growth and disease and evolution and decay as well. So what I did was let my imagination go wild and imagine how these uh, creatures and this plant life under sea might 
morph and change and I found that uh, using alcohol ink, which is the major paint that I used in this body of work, I'm just going to take this one down here so that you can see a little better. In these paintings I've used uh, encaustic, so it has an encaustic surface here. And I've added alcohol ink on the surface. So you might see, uh, often people see different things in, in the, this series of paintings. This looks kind of uh, jellyfish-like to me. And you may be able to see that it's got quite a three-dimensional surface on it. I can't go too close and give you a sense of that, but the, it's covered in three-dimensional dots and lines and also carved in. So that's one of the wonderful things about uh, working with encaustic is you can carve into the surface. So a couple of other examples of this undersea life. Another kind of jellyfish-like painting. Again, it has a three-dimensional surface on it. And you can see the beautiful shine on that surface of the wax. A couple more images. This is a bit more in the undersea life, plant life sort of theme. Again, here I've used the uh, I've used a electric stylus to add these three-dimensional lines in here. And again, these are sort of imagination of how uh, this plant life might morph over time due to climate change and how beautiful that is, but how almost mutational it is in a way as well. So a couple more. This lovely sense of movement that comes because of the material that I've used. And I did a whole talk and a, and a demonstration as well on alcohol ink and how it moves on the surface of the wax and how it morphs in itself. So you can see perhaps how the ink breaks up into this cell-like structure, which I find really beautiful. Again, three-dimensional surface here. One of the beautiful things about encaustic is how it's very tactile and, and it's, it kind of calls out to be touched. So I'm gonna show you a couple more. This one, people often say looks a bit like a seahorse. That's the fun thing with this series of paintings. I love hearing what people can see in these paintings. One more. This one looks a bit like a squid to me. Again, this wonderful sense of movement. It's got that, that sense of water moving. All of these plants and this, these creatures are always moving, of course, in the water. And this one is particularly three-dimensional. So again, I'm not sure if you can tell about that, but uh, this textured surface is built way up on the surface and for me that's been really fun because it takes that idea of growth and mutation even further that the wax and the ink itself are growing on the surface of the painting and I talked a lot in uh, one of my previous Instagram lives about how I have to kind of let go of some control as the artist when I'm creating because it is very hard to manage this material and I have to let the material itself take over to some degree and work in partnership with it. So um, I wanted to just finish up by talking about how I find the stories in my art and how I hear them. Um, I used to work when I would be painting, I would listen to music or a podcast perhaps, but now generally I just work in silence and I listen to my heart and I find that that's the best way for me to hear the narrative and that's how it's revealed. 
And as I mentioned earlier, I often do research after. I get these ideas and then I research them and I ponder them and that's how the story develops. And I find that that process of making art really helps me to understand what I'm grappling with in my life and that experience of being human. So I hope that um, this helps you understand a little bit about the narratives in my work and how story plays a role. I thought I would bring you back to that first story about the white dud, that failed painting that the um, person who came into my studio who was looking at it and debating whether to buy it and I was debating whether to tell her the truth and tell her that at one point it was such a failure. So I will bring up that image for you again so you can see what it looked like at the time. And in the end, when I reworked it, that is what the painting looked like. In the end, she bought the painting, which was great. And one of the things I love about that idea of sending a painting out into someone else's life and into their home or their workplace is that it begins to have its own story and that story is built upon. And I felt um, happy about sending it out with a story for her. And if you think about paintings in your home that maybe you grew up with, how they kind of get woven into your own life story and how much narrative and history is in those stories or the, that art that we have in our home and how intimately art can be woven into our lives.